Hello everybody and welcome to Project Trade. This is our biographical series on the life and times of the chairs of the Federal Reserve. William Proctor Gould Harding was born in the town of Beligi in the state of Alabama in the country of the United States on May the 5th, 1864. Thus continuing a now three in a row streak of Federal Reserve heads to be born during the American Civil War. Harding's grandfather, Chester Harding, was a respected portrait painter, but William P.G. would not take up that same creative brush. Instead, he would witness the ever-improving position of the US economy before his eyes whilst growing up in the gilded age of the country, a time of expansion and wealth creation which encouraged Harding to pursue a career that would push him towards the very heart of that economy. After growing through his childhood, Harding received a Bachelor of Arts and then a Master of Arts from the University of Alabama in 1881. Being only 17 years old when he achieved this, at the time he was the youngest ever student to attain his degree. Being so young, Harding was not yet done with his education as he would take take on a business studies course in Poughkeepsie, New York, before returning to Alabama to work as a bookkeeper at the bank J.H. Fitz & Co., his first step in what would become an extensive career in banking. That's one small step for William, one giant leap for the Alabamian banking system. His promotions would come from hard work, and Harding would begin to climb the institutional ladder, rising from his position as a bookkeeper to cashier to vice president to eventually becoming president of what was then the largest bank in Alabama, the First National Bank of Birmingham. Harding would wed during this time period as well, marrying Amanda Moore. Amanda was familiarly connected in Alabama as she was a goddaughter of Sydenham Moore, an Alabamian congressman and former Confederate Army colonel. William and Amanda had three children together, however Amanda would sadly pass away in 1910. Nevertheless, Harding continued to throw himself further into the finance sector and everything Alabama. He was appointed president of the Alabama Alabama Bankers Association, as well as president of the Birmingham Chamber of Commerce. Both William Harding and Alabama were beginning to flourish. His banking career had developed alongside a rapid population growth in Alabama. While Harding lived there, the city of Birmingham had grown from having around only 10,000 citizens to having about 150,000 citizens. Business was booming. However, despite becoming an Alabamian banking hero, Harding would sell out from his businesses in Alabama when he was appointed as a member of the Federal Reserve Board in 1914 by then Democratic President Woodrow Wilson. Harding would first read about his appointment in the newspaper and was initially unsure about taking the role due to the costly pay cut he would invariably have to suffer through. He was eventually convinced to get on board by Wilson's emphasis on the ever so righteous patriotic nature of the position. The honour of serving one's country an incredible role of influence and power. Despite having never met Wilson at this point, Harding was persuaded. The Federal Reserve had only come into existence the year prior when the Federal Reserve Act 1913 had passed, but the year after passing the legislation, US Treasury Secretary William McAdoo and his assistant Charles Hamlin were busy setting up the practical base and structure that would bring the Federal Reserve to life. Harding would push for his beloved Birmingham, Alabama to become home to one of the 12 regional federal banks which were established at the time, but Birmingham would miss out and Harding would have to settle for one in the city and state next door, Atlanta, Georgia. Harding was a founding member of the Federal Reserve Board, a position he held until August the 10th, 1916, when he was appointed by Woodrow Wilson to the top of the pile as chair, or as it was then at least, the governor of the Federal Reserve. He would take over from Charles Hamlin and become the second chair of the reserve. Interestingly, both of the forerunners to the position, McAdoo and Hamlin, were from a legal background in their education and working experience, Harding's appointment was the first time we would see a Federal Reserve leader who came up through the banking sector. He was qualified to the position through experience. It is important to remember though that at this time in the history of the Federal Reserve, the chair was a position that was still subordinate to the Treasury Secretary. Throughout his time as chair, Harding would serve under four of these Treasury Secretaries. The first Treasury Secretary who Harding worked under was, as we know, William McAdoo. In less than a year, after Harding took the chair position, the US would enter World War I on April the 2nd, 1917, so the attention of both the Treasury and the Federal Reserve turned to maintaining a strong US dollar and economy. This had already been a focus since the war had begun in July 1914, but now with direct US involvement, the stakes were raised. Harding would assist McAdoo in promoting Liberty Loan Bonds, the patriotically named government bonds which would help raise money for the war effort. These were also promoted by celebrities of the time, such as Charlie Chaplin and Douglas Fairbanks, and they were widely adopted by the public throughout the war. Further to this, heavy 
restrictions on the export of gold and currency were put into place to protect the US dollar and to stop any adversaries getting their hands on US gold and depleting their reserves. Also, inflation was a problem that had begun to spiral out of control during the war. When the war had started, the inflation rate in the US was sat at a very moderate 1%, but by the time the US entered the war just under three years later, inflation was already at 18.9%. The Treasury found this wartime inflation difficult to deal with as global transport and logistics had slowed dramatically due to the ongoing war. In April 1918, while still chair of the Federal Reserve, Harding was also appointed as managing director to the War Finance Corporation, working closely with currency comptroller and fellow Federal Reserve board member John Skelton Williams. When establishing the War Finance Corporation, Treasury Secretary McAdoo described it as a measure to enable both national banks and state banks to continue to furnish essential credits for industries and enterprises which are necessary or contributory to the prosecution of the war. Credit had become less available due to the increased borrowing undertaken by the US government during the war, so the Treasury aimed to remedy this with loans into industries such as agriculture and machinery. Harding saw the actions of the government and the federal board at this time as important contributions towards the winning of the war which would be achieved by the Allied powers in November 1918. William McAdoo finished his role as Treasury Secretary a month after the war ended and he was succeeded by the chair of the House Banking Committee, Carter Glass, who had had a strong hand in helping Woodrow Wilson pass the original Federal Reserve Act back in 1913. Not long after Glass took office, two of the founding members of the Federal Reserve Board as well as the Secretary would resign. Paul Warburg, Frederick Delano and Henry Willis stepped down from their respective positions after four years each at the post, the first of which had been the Vice Chair for the previous two years under Harding and the second of which had been Vice Chair for the two years prior to that. It was a considerable amount of experience leaving the Federal Reserve in a short space of time, a bitter pill for Harding to swallow. This was also around the time when Harding finished his role as Managing Director of the War Finance Corporation after 12 months at the top of the organisation. He would hand over the reins as Managing Director to future Chair of the Federal Reserve, Eugene Meyer, but Harding would nevertheless remain as a Director on the board for another two years. Meanwhile, that pesky inflation problem had persisted throughout the country in the years following the war. It was up to 20.4% when Carter Glass left his position as Treasury Secretary in February 1920. He had been appointed to a Senate seat of Virginia following the death of Thomas Martin and he happily took up that mantle. Glass was succeeded by David Houston who would see the apex of the inflation in June of that year at a rather high 23.7%. Houston served as Treasury Secretary for less than a year until the end of Woodrow Wilson's second term as Republican Warren G. Harding was able to defeat Democratic candidate James Cox in the 1920 presidential election. When Warren G. Harding entered the White House in 1921, he appointed his own man, Andrew Mellon, to the position of Treasury Secretary. Despite Wilson and Houston being out of office, it was, however, still the term of William Harding as the chair of the Federal Reserve Board. Criticism was a common occurrence to his ears at this point, though, and he came under heavy scrutiny from Republicans for having no no prior professional relationship with the new president. Furthermore, the plague of inflation that had ran rampant over the country for around half a decade had swiftly turned into sharp deflation, swinging to a low of minus 15.8% by June 1921. This deflation was as unwelcome as the inflation had been prior. The US entered a deep recession, commodity prices took a sudden downturn, the Dow Jones Industrial Average dropped over 40% from its high 18 months prior. This was the chaos that ensued before the Roaring Twenties would later emerge, but combining these problems at the time would lead to Harding failing to achieve reappointment as chair of the Federal Reserve from the president. His term therefore expired on the 9th of August 1922 after having stayed six years in the office. The position would be temporarily filled by Pierre Andrew until May the 1st 1923 when Daniel Christinger, close friend and former neighbour of President President Harding was appointed as chair. This was only three months before President Harding would in fact die of a heart attack. Following his term as the chair of the Federal Reserve, William Harding was hired to help restructure the Cuban financial system at the behest of their president, Alfredo Zayas. Harding would not undertake this task for long though as he would return to the Federal Reserve system in 1923, having been appointed as president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. As president of the Boston Bank, he would put a greater emphasis on fossil fostering better 
relationships between his and the other regional banks, as well as advocating for their rights and powers within the system. In 1925, Harding wrote and published a book titled The Formative Period of the Federal Reserve System, in which he discusses those initial years at the Federal Reserve. He remained in his position as president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston until he died from heart failure in 1930, age 65. A true and thorough banker's banker and second chair of the Federal Reserve, William Proctor Gould Harding had come a long way through the Alabamian banking system, working in almost every capacity possible. Following his success at home and the tragic passing of his wife, he would take on what he saw as more patriotic roles in the public sector, roles that he saw as vital to the well-being of the country, particularly within the context of the time, a time which Harding referred to as a world in crisis. Thank you for being here. As always, more information can be found in the video description if it just doesn't make sense as to why this is all over now.